Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, how many of you, it's your very first time more than the score? Very first. Well, welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, we have about 1,600 online as well that have joined us, so welcome at home audience. We're glad you're, you're tuning in this morning. I'm Althea Brooks, and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the Office of Engagement, and it is indeed my pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. We have a, uh, a great talk coming up, um, and I think many of you have, tuned, have tuned in and turned out just for this talk. Are you here? Uh, for the near-death experience? Yes. And how many of you have had a near-death experience? Wow, wow, this is fascinating, so welcome. We have five more great lectures that um, this, this fall that More Than Score will offer you, uh, so we look forward to seeing you for all five of those. Um, also check out the Lifetime Learning website for virtual and in-person programs. Um, find us on engagement.virginia.edu backslash learn. And we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Bruce Grayson. He is the Carlson Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences in the D Division of Perpetual Studies in the School of Medicine. And Dr. Grayson will be speaking with us about the near-death experiences and his research, and I'm, I'm really excited to learn from him today. Um, before we begin, go ahead and silence the ringer on your phones. Go ahead and power down um, for us. Uh, at the end of the program, Dr. Grayson will be uh, taking questions from the audience here, um, and we have two microphones that will be passed around. We ask that you speak right into the, the, the microphone. Um, and then also um, state your name and your UVA affiliation, if you will. All right, to introduce Dr. Grayson, I have a few questions that I'm going to ask him. Dr. Grayson, why don't you come on up and uh, be with me this morning to answer a few questions? Yeah, I hope, Thank you. hope they can feel really welcome. Right. Okay, so you have published over 100 articles about near-death experiences in the peer review and medical journals and three books. Um, what captured your interest in researching near-death experiences and what has intrigued you and kept you researching it? Uh, I think as a psychiatrist who makes my living trying to help people change their lives, what captured me most about near-death experiences is their, their incredible ability to create profound changes in people's lives. Uh, it's much more powerful than anything, any tools we have. Thank you, thank you. Um, in three books, do you wanna tell us a little bit about your most recent book? Well, the most recent book is called After. Um, a doctor explores what near-death experiences reveal about life and beyond. And one of my previous works have been done for an academic audience. This is the first one that's geared towards an intelligent lay audience in plain English. You can all understand it. Um, so it took me, I guess, 50 years to write this book. Um, I had to be retired before I had the time to do it. And I feel like it's um, summarizing my, my entire career. And uh, the UVA bookstore is here today, and they have books right over here that they're, they're, they'll be selling after the program. We also have a copy that we'll be giving away to a lucky person this morning. Um, you did your residency at UVA, correct? Yes. And uh, where did you receive your undergraduate and medical school degrees? Um, I did undergraduate work at Cornell University and medical school at the State University of New York Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse. Okay, and you've held positions at the universities of Michigan and Connecticut. Right. Um, how long have you served here at UVA? Well, I was here in the 1970s for about five years and then left for a while, uh, came back, and I've been here for the last 27 years at UVA. Now that's worth an applause. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Grayson, welcome to More Than The Score, um, and we look forward to learning from you this morning. Welcome. Thank you, Althea. I'm honored to be here. And it's nice to see so many orange shirts in the audience. Um, we've known about near-death experiences for centuries. Uh, they appear in the literature of ancient Greece and Rome, and yet consistent research programs into near-death experiences 
didn't start until 1975 when a University of, of Virginia psychiatrist named Raymond Moody published a book called Life After Life, in which he gave us the term near-death experience and described what they were like. Research into near-death experiences, or NDEs, um, really got a big boost about 40 years ago when the International Association for Near-Death Studies uh, was founded, and shortly thereafter, the Journal of Near-Death Studies. Uh, the only peer-reviewed journal dealing with this topic. So I'd like to explain to you uh, what I think it is we've learned in the last 40 years. To get us on the same page, a near-death experience is not just coming close to death, but having a profound subjective experience at that time that often has what some people call a mystical or paranormal element to it. Now, when you start talking about near-death experiences, there are immediate problems in researching them. First is that we were originally dealing with what we found out later were biased samples. We were starting out in the 1970s and early 80s looking at people who came forward to us saying, let me tell you about my NDE. And we didn't realize it at the time, but people who were coming to us were those who had, first of all, good verbal skills, and secondly, had positive experiences they wanted to share. And it wasn't until many years later that we started interviewing whole cohorts of patients in hospitals who had come close to death that we realized there were some experiences that were not very pleasant. So we realized that just relying on volunteers was giving us a biased sample. Second problem is that when you ask near-death experiences what happened, they often start by saying, I, I can't describe it. There are no words for this. Uh, one experience you told me was like trying to draw an odor with a box of crayons. No matter how many crayons you use, you can't draw what an odor is like. And they say, that's what it is, trying to put NDEs into words. And then we researchers say, great, tell me about it. So we know that we're asking them to distort the experience by describing it. And to do so, many of them use metaphors. Uh, they'll say, you know, then I, I went to this tunnel. Well, it wasn't really a tunnel, but that's what I'm going to call it. And their metaphors usually come from their cultural background or their religious background. And that raises the question of what's the cultural influence on near-death experiences. And we found over the past 50 years, studying NDEs from different cultures, different religious groups, and throughout the centuries, that the cultural background and your religious background do not affect whether you're going to have an experience or what type you're going to have, but it does influence the metaphors you use to describe it. Let me give you an example. Um, many people got report going through a long, dark, and closed space to get from this physical world to the other realm or dimension that they feel the NDE occurs in. And people from more developed countries like ours will often call this a tunnel. People from less developed countries where there aren't a lot of tunnels will not use that word. They may say, I went into a cave, or I fell into a well, or I fell into this, the throat of a giant flower. I interviewed one person who was a truck driver here in the US who said, and then I got sucked into this long tailpipe. <laughs> so whatever metaphors come easiest to you are the ones you use. Another problem that comes up often is the fact that many people are not willing to talk about their near-death experience. They are sometimes, with good reason, afraid they'll be ridiculed or labeled as crazy or misunderstood. And some just feel it's too personal or too sacred to share with other people. And finally, when we first started out doing this work, back in the 1970s, early 80s, there were very few of us doing this research, and we were mostly individuals working at our own universities without contact with others. So we weren't necessarily asking the same questions of all our experiencers. Some who were interested in emotional state talked about the feelings of peace and well-being. Others interested in the paranormal elements talked about leaving the body. Others who had more of a religious background talked about uh, seeing God. 
and we weren't really sure that we were all collecting the same experience. So in the early 1980s, we developed the near-death experience scale, the NDE scale, to get us all on the same page to make sure we were all studying the same experience. And that was a tremendous help. It's now been translated into 20 different languages and used in thousands of studies all around the world. So once we surmount these problems, we're faced with how do you know that these are real? Neil deGrasse Tyson makes this distinction between objective and subjective reality. For example, if you are feeling hungry right now, that's a subjective reality for you, but no one else can corroborate it, so it's subjective. On the other hand, objective realities are things that other people can corroborate. For example, you can all agree that there's a slide up there because you're all seeing it. And I would argue that near-death experiences, despite what people think, are an objective reality because they're the same for, that people report all over the world and back through the centuries. And some of them have elements in them that you can actually corroborate with physical evidence along the way. They are furthermore quite independent from our cultural models. Because we've been doing this research at the University of Virginia for uh, 50 years, we started collecting cases a decade or so before Moody wrote his book telling us what near-death experiences were. We had never named for them, but we still collected them. And we recently compared 20 of our best cases from those pre-Moody days in the 1960s with cases we've uh, collected in recent years, matched by age, gender, how close they came to death, how they came close to death, religious background. And we found no difference between what people told us before Moody wrote his book and what they're telling us now. Furthermore, many people's near-death experiences contradict what their religions had told them to believe what happened when you die. So we don't think that expectation plays a large role in these. One more piece of evidence is that very young children, age two, three, four, who haven't been indoctrinated as to what death is, talk about the same near-death experiences as adults do. And we see the same NDEs from cultures around the world and going back to ancient Greece and Rome. It's also true that because we've been doing this for so many years, we've been able to go back and find people we interviewed back in the 1980s, interview them again today, and see whether their memories have changed at all, because we know that most of our memories change over time. That's not true of memories of near-death experiences. They do not change over time. Some people have speculated that maybe they get more blissful over time as you retell them again and again, and the data show that is not the case. They're consistent. Now that tells us that the NDE memories are reliable. It doesn't tell us whether they are valid, they are real experiences. If you ask the experiencers themselves, they say, the near-death experience was realer than real. I've had people look at me after an experience and say, my talking to God in the NDE is more real than my talking to you right now. Now, I'm not sure what that means. I don't know how to judge what's more real than something else, but they consistently say that. There are now scales that can differentiate memories of real events from memories of things you just thought might happen or you dreamt or hallucinated. The scale was developed to differentiate the memories of children who had child abuse, the ones who imagined it and the ones who really were abused. And there are consistent differences between memories of real events and memories of imagined events in terms of the clarity of the memory, uh, the, the memory of the, for the context around the event, uh, the sensory aspects, whether you can also remember seeing and, and hearing and smelling things at the time, uh, the way the memory is uh, recalled over time, and uh, the, way, the way it affects you afterwards. When we've given this scale of how valid the memories are to near-death experiencers, ask them to rate the memory of the NDE and the memory of a real event that happened at the same time in their lives, and the memory of something they expected but didn't happen, that they were only imagined, we find that the memories of the NDEs are like the memories of real events, not at all like the memories of imagined events. In fact, on this objective scale, they look more real than the memories of real events, which is just what NDEs have been telling us. It's more real than real. 
We did this research at UVA. It was also replicated at the University of Liège in Belgium and the University of Padua in Italy. And in fact, the Italian group also measured the brain waves of people as they were remembering their events. And they reported that the EEGs of people remembering NDEs looked like people remembering real events, not like people remembering dreams or hallucinations. So what are the common features that are reported across the globe in NDEs? First, there are consistent changes in thinking. People report that their thoughts are more rapid and more clear than ever before. They have a sense that there's no time in this other realm of the NDE. Time just doesn't exist there. They report often a sense of revelation or sudden understanding of everything, and a sense of life review where the life flashes before them. And what's most remarkable about the life review is that in many cases, they report reliving events not only through their own lives, but also through the perspectives of other people involved. Let me give you an example of this. Tom was in his mid-30s, working in his driveway underneath his truck, and something slipped and the truck came down, crushing his chest. He had a very elaborate near-death experience, and part of that was a life review. And he described many events, and one he, that stood out to me is he re recalled being a teenager and driving his pickup truck down the street, and a drunk man wandered out in front of the car, in front of this truck. He jammed on the brakes. It was a hot summer afternoon. The window was open. So he started yelling at the man out the window. And the man, being quite intoxicated, reached his hand in the window and slapped Tom across the face. That was too much for this hot-headed teenager. So he got out of the truck and started beating the man mercilessly until he was just a crumbled mess on the median strip. Now, when he re relived this in his life review, he relived it through his, uh, his eyes, feeling the adrenaline rush and the rage, but simultaneously through the eyes of the man he beat up, feeling his nose getting bloody, feeling his teeth going through his lower lip, feeling the humiliation of being beaten up by a teenager, and feeling the 32 blows of Tom's fists in his face. Now, Tom couldn't have told you it was 32, but when he lifted it through the man's eyes, he felt each one of those 32 blows. And Tom came back from that with a sense that when you hurt other people, you're also hurting yourself. And I've heard that again and again from near-death experiences, that they learn in the NDE, we are not separate individuals, we're all part of the same thing. There are also consistent changes in emotional state, in feeling states. People often report a sense of overwhelming peace and well-being sometimes a sense of joy or bliss, a sense of cosmic unity or being one with everything, and a sense of experiencing unconditional love, often from a being of light that they may interpret as being um, divine. There are also consistent changes in anomalous features that are sometimes called paranormal. People report that they're usual senses, uh, vision, hearing, and so forth, are much more vivid than ever before. They report seeing colors they'd never seen on Earth, hearing, hearing sounds they'd never heard before. Some report frank extrasensory perception, becoming aware of things outside the range of the body's senses. A few sometimes report visions of the future, their own future, that came true later on. And many report a sense of being out of the body, now, many of these reports of out-of-body experiences are not easy to corroborate. They'll say, I floated out of the body, I was being operated, and I saw the surgeons working on me, and then I went back in. And there's not much you can do with that. But occasionally we see cases where we have verifiable events. Al was in his mid-50s when he had crushing chest pain as he was driving his truck. He was rushed to the emergency room. And while they were doing the evaluation of him, they discovered that four of the vessels supplying his heart were clogged. So they rushed him to the operating room for an emergency quadruple bypass surgery. He later told me that in the middle of the operation, he rose up out of his body. And to his astonishment, he looked down and there he was on the operating table. And he saw his surgeon flapping his arms like he was trying to fly. Now, when Al told me this, and our time not laughing. 
I've been a doctor for, for about 30 years at that time. I'd never seen or heard anything like this. You don't see doctors on TV doing that. <laughs> so I said to Al, you know, maybe that was an hallucination. You were, you were anesthetized. He said, no, no. You talk to my surgeon. You ask him about this. So I did. And a surgeon who's a very straight-laced, no-nonsense guy sheepishly admitted, well, yes, I do do that. I'd never seen anybody else do this, but I developed this habit of letting my residents start the operation while I get my sterile gown and gloves on. And then I walk into the operating room to supervise them. And I put my hands where I know they won't touch anything that's not in a sterile field, right on my chest. And then I point out things to them, to my assistants, with my elbows so I won't risk touching anything. Now, I don't know how Al could have known about that unless, as he said, he saw it. And the surgeon said the same thing. I don't know how else he could have known about that. There are also what we call transcendent features, where people feel they have left this realm somehow and gone to some other realm or dimension of reality where they encounter some being they regard as a mystical being, where they actually see deceased spirits of loved ones, and they come to a border or point of no return beyond which they can't keep going and still return to life. So what do we, what do we make of these experiences? There have been several physiological explanations that have been proposed to explain NDEs. And the first and most obvious was a lack of oxygen near death. And this is obvious because no matter how you come close to death, one of the final things that happens to you is you stop getting oxygen to your brain. So that's common to all types of near-death events. But we know from decades of experience with patients that what happens when you lose oxygen is that you become agitated, belligerent, frightened, confused, very much unlike the calm, peaceful sense of a near-death experience. Furthermore, several researchers, Mike Sabom in this country, Sam Parnia in the UK, Pim Van Lummel in Holland, have been able to measure oxygen content in patients who are coming near death. And what they found was that those who have had near-death experiences actually have better oxygen saturation than people who don't. That doesn't mean they have more near-death experiences, it just may mean they're better capable of remembering them if they've had better oxygenation. But it certainly doesn't mean that oxygen is, deprivation is causing the NDE. Likewise, with drugs given to patients as they approach death. Research done here at UVA and also in India has shown consistently that the more drugs patients are given as they approach death, the less likely they are to report a near-death experience. And if they do, it's likely to be a very shallow, not elaborate one. So again, drugs do not seem to be causing the NDE. There are theories that some chemical produced in the brain under stress, like when you're approaching death, plays a role in near-death experiences. And people most often mention endorphins, which are those feel-good chemicals that are produced under stress that give you the runner high and so forth. There have also been theories that the brain produces a chemical like ketamine or like DMT that can make you hallucinate when you're under stress like this. Uh, these are plausible theories, but there is no data to support any of them at this point. It's almost impossible to measure someone's uh, brain for these chemicals when you're trying to re rescue them from resuscitation uh, when they're being uh, close to death. So we don't really have any data bearing on this. There's also theories that abnormal electrical activity in the brain as you're approaching death may be responsible for near-death experiences. This is most often focused on the temporal lobe of the brain because there was a mistaken assumption that people with temporal lobe epilepsy have religious experiences. And much recent research in the last few decades, including done here at UVA, has shown that is not the case. We studied a series of 100 consecutive patients in our epilepsy clinic, and we found that about 7% of them had something at least vaguely like an out-of-body experience, but they were not linked to the temporal lobe. There were all different parts of the brain involved in this. Um, there have also been reports recently about uh, electrical surges in the brains of rats as they were 
sacrificed. Um, it's not clear how relevant that is to people. We don't ask the rats what they experienced. Um, but they also did not happen if the rats were anesthetized first, and it lasted only about 30 seconds after they were sacrificed. And we know NDEs last longer than that, and they're not inhibited by anesthesia. There are occasional reports of someone who, just by coincidence, happened to be having their brain waves monitored as they had a cardiac arrest. And there have been inconsistent reports about this. Some do, do suggest that there's a change in the brain waves. Uh, most do not. Um, and in fact, some report even that the brain waves stop before the circulation of the brain stops. So we don't have an answer for this yet. There are also many psychological theories that have been proposed to explain NDEs. And one is that expectation or wishful thinking is responsible for them. You are expecting to die, so of course you want to be reunited with a deceased loved one, so you imagine uh, seeing them. Well, we know that a lot of NDEs directly contradict your expectations. Um, in addition, some of these people who report seeing a deceased loved one did not know that the person had died, which takes wishful thinking off the table. Uh, Pliny the Elder wrote about a case like this in the first century. Uh, so we know that these are not new experiences. Uh, let me give you an example of this. One fellow I, I interviewed was a 25-year-old technical writer who was hospitalized with severe pneumonia. He had repeated respiratory arrest incidents where he couldn't breathe. And in the hospital, he had one particular nurse, Anita, who was about his age, um, who would see him every day. And one day she told him she was going to be taking a long weekend off and other nurses would be substituting for her. While she was gone, he had another respiratory arrest where he had to be resuscitated. And during that one, he had a near-death experience. And he found himself in a beautiful pastoral scene. And there, to his surprise, Anita came walking towards him. He said, Anita, what are you doing here? She said, Al, you need to go, I'm saying, Jack, Jack, you need to go back to your body. And I want you to find my parents and tell them that I'm sorry I wrecked the red MGB. And then she walked off. When he later woke up back in his body in the hospital room, he had full memory of this experience. And he tried to tell the first nurse who walked into his room. And she got very upset and rushed right out. It turned that his nurse, Anita, had taken the weekend off to celebrate her 21st birthday. And her parents surprised her with the gift of a red MGB. She got excited, jumped in the car for a test drive, lost control and crashed into a telephone pole and died instantly, just a few hours before his near-death experience. Now, how would he have known that she died, or let alone how she died, and yet he did? So I think we can take expectation and wishful thinking off the table. There's also some data showing that people who have near-death experiences also have another personality trait, which has been called boundary thinness or fantasy proneness or absorption, or uh, it's, it's basically access to your inner experience. People who remember their dreams are more like this. The question is, we have a correlation between having a near-death experience and having this trait, but we don't know whether the people had this trait before the NDE, which made them more likely to have one, or whether this is the result of having an NDE, which then opened you up to becoming more aware of your inner states. So we have a correlation, but that doesn't imply what the cause is. There have been also people who claim that near-death experiences are some form of mental illness or related to mental illness. Well, being a psychiatrist, I thought I knew a lot about mental illness, and they didn't sound like near-death experiences to me. But being a researcher, we did studies of this, and we looked at the possible association between mental illnesses of various types and NDEs. First, we looked, took a large sample of near-death experiencers and surveyed them for symptoms of mental illness. And we found that they had the same rate of mental illness as people who didn't have NDEs. And then we interviewed everybody who came to the psychiatric clinic over the course of a year seeking psychiatric help, some 800 people. And we asked them about 
previous brushes with death and near-death experiences. And we found that the incidence of NDEs among these psychiatric patients was the same as it is among people who aren't psychiatric patients. So there does not seem to be any association between mental illness and near-death experiences. The DSM, which is the um, Diagnostic Bible for Mental Illness, requires that you have significant distress or impairment to diagnose a mental disorder. And near-death experiences generally do not have that. Furthermore, many clinicians have published papers about the contrasts between near-death experiences and various types of hallucinations or delusions uh, that are part of mental illness. And they are dramatically different in their content of the NDE, in the context in which they occur, in the way they're remembered, and their profound effects on people. All of these explanatory models, both the physiological and the psychological, are based on analogies. The NDE reminds someone of a psychedelic drug trip, so they said, well, then maybe that's what's going on. None of them are based on attempts to induce a near-death experience by applying any of these things. So we're dealing with analogies. And it reminds me of the Hindu parable of the blind man and the elephant. Someone introduces an elephant to these blind men who grab a different part of the elephant and try to see what it's like. And one grabs the trunk and says, an elephant's like a snake. And each one grabs a different part of the elephant and has a reasonable analogy for what the elephant is like. But none of them grasp the entire animal. And I think we're in the same situation with near-death experiences. Different researchers grab one little part of it and say, oh, uh, NDEs are like endorphin bursts, or NDEs are like temporal lobe seizures, but none of them explains the entire animal. So where does that leave us? I want to turn to what I think is the most important aspect of NDEs, which is not the experience itself, but the after effects. And that is, I think, the way they differ most dramatically from dreams or hallucinations. Most near-death experiencers and their families say, this person has been totally transformed. So what are the common after effects? First, there are profound changes in attitude. And most often, people report that after the near-death experience, I am no longer afraid of death or dying. When I first heard this, as a psychiatrist, I was worried that if we tell people that, that death is not something to be afraid of, this might make people more suicidal. Because I had worked with people who were thinking about taking their lives that were deterred because they were afraid of what might happen if they did that. If we tell them nothing bad's gonna happen, will that make them more suicidal? So we did a study. We interviewed people who were admitted to the hospital after a suicide attempt. And we compared those who had a near-death experience as a result of the suicide attempt and those who didn't. And what we found, to my surprise, was that those who had a near-death experience were much less suicidal than those who didn't. Now, that seemed counterintuitive to me, so I asked the experiencers, what's made this difference for you? And they said, you know, I still have the same problems that made me want to take my life. But now I see there's a purpose to everything that happens and a meaning to my life that I didn't see before. And I see that my problems are something to be learned from, not something to run away from. They also say that once you're not afraid of dying, you're also not afraid of living. You can take risks. You can jump in with both feet and live in the moment. What's the worst that happens? You die. Great. <laughs> now, most people who come close to death, whether they've had an end of year or not, value life more highly, because they've almost lost it. But people who haven't had an NDE often become much more cautious and conservative because of that. And they become much more frightened of dying. Whereas near-death experiencers don't have that reaction. They become less cautious and more risk-taking. Uh, and they end up enjoying life much more because of that. Along with that decreased fear of death, people also report a decreased valuation of worldly things, not only material possessions, but power, prestige, fame, competition, no longer mean the same things to them. 
that doesn't mean they don't enjoy things like good food. They just no longer feel addicted to them. If they don't have them, that's fine too. They often report an enhanced sense of spirituality. Interestingly, not an increased sense of religiosity. They don't usually become more devout in a religion, but they feel more a sense of spiritual connection to everything. They feel connected to other people, to the natural world, to the divine, and that gives them a sense of compassion for other people as well. And this often leads to changes in behavior. <clears throat> people find that their relationships change after an NDE. Sometimes relationships end because of an NDE. Um, they become generally more altruistic, more outgoing. They volunteer a lot more. And for better or worse, most of them who have a lifestyle that wasn't con con uh, con wasn't agreeable to their new found set of values have to make drastic changes. And sometimes that means a change of profession. People who are in a violent profession, such as career military officers or police officers, may find that they can no longer shoot someone, even in self-defense, and they have to leave that job. Others who are in cutthroat businesses feel that getting ahead at someone else's expense no longer makes sense to them. And they either change the way they work or change their line of work entirely. And many of them go into helping professions, healthcare, teaching, social work, clergy, so forth. Now, some people have a great deal of difficulty after coming back from an NDE. It's difficult sometimes for them to be, find themselves back in this physical world. <laughs> They often report having trouble with other people's reactions to them. Spouses and children don't like the changes in this experience. Or, um, they sometimes feel sad or angry about being back here. They sometimes question their own mental health after this experience when everyone tells them they're crazy. And they sometimes come to seek help, often from professionals. So what are the larger implications of the NDE beyond the individual experiencer? We sometimes argue about whether the NDE is a physical event or a psychological event or a spiritual event. I think this is a bogus distinction. I think it's all three of them. Um, Andy Newberg, a neuroradiologist at the University of Pennsylvania, did a study of the neuroimaging of Carmelite nuns as they were trying to commune with God. And he found that when they thought they were successful, certain parts of the brain consistently lit up, became more active. And when he showed these brain scans to his fellow neuroscientists, they said, oh, so that's the part of the brain that gives you the illusion of talking to God. He showed the same scans to the nuns. And they said, so that's the part of the brain that God uses to talk to me. So you had the data that are open to multiple interpretations. Uh, if I ask you to describe this room, this building, you could say, well, it's got a brick exterior, it's uh, roughly rectangular in shape and so forth, and you can tell me what it's made of. Or you could tell me, this is the old Kappa Phi house. Well, neither one of those is wrong. Neither one by itself is a complete description. You need all parts of it. You need the physical and the spiritual and the psychological to understand near-death experiences. Just because one person is right doesn't mean someone else is wrong. <laughs> The near-death experience also raises questions about the relationship between mind and brain. We often are taught that the mind is what the brain does, that all our thoughts and perceptions and feelings come from the electrical and chemical activity of the brain. No one knows how, but it's magic, it happens. And some people act as if mind and brain are interchangeable, they're really the same thing. By mind, I mean that part of you that thinks and feels and perceives. And by brain, I mean that organ inside your skull. And I'll argue that near-death experiences suggest they are not the same thing. That when the brain does not seem to be functioning very well in many near-death experiences, the mind is functioning better than ever. So we have evidence from near-death experiences that the mind can sometimes function without the activity of the brain. 
But this isn't the only area of, of evidence. There's something called terminal lucidity, in which people who have end-stage dementia, who haven't been able to recognize family for months or years, can't communicate, suddenly become totally lucid again in the hours or sometimes days before death. And there's no medical explanation for how you can regenerate a, a brain that's demented. And yet they do shortly before they die. There's also been neuroimaging of psychedelic drug trips in the last 10 or 15 years that have consistently showed that the more elaborate mystical experiences with psychedelic drugs are associated with a decrease in activity of the brain, not an increase. So all this suggests that the mind and the brain are not the same thing. Physician Larry Dossi says we're conscious not because of the brain, but in spite of it. One idea to explain this is that the brain is not the producer of consciousness, but the filter of consciousness. This is not a new idea. Hippocrates wrote 2,000 years ago that the brain is the interpreter of the mind. And there's evidence that the brain may be doing that with our thoughts. People use the analogy of a radio receiver. There are thousands of radio stations out there broadcasting all the time. If you tried to listen to all of them, you wouldn't understand any of it. So what the radio tuner does is select one station you want to listen to and filter out all the others so you can process it. And the idea is that the brain evolved as a physical organ like the rest of our organs to help us survive in the physical world. And to do that, it takes all of your consciousness and filters out all the, quote, irrelevant stuff. Things like communing with God or talking to deceased loved ones. And just focuses on stuff that's important, like how to find food and shelter and abate and avoid predators. And that makes sense in terms of our evolution. Is it true? We know that there are filters in the nervous system, starting with our eyes and ears. There's a huge spectrum of electromagnetic activity that we don't see. We just see the small visual field. We don't see the infrared and the ultraviolet. Some animals do, but they're not critical to us. So we don't see the whole thing. Our eyes filter out. Likewise, our ears, we just hear a small range of frequencies. We don't hear things that dogs used to hear, for example, or bats. So we know that the filtering starts out there. There's also something called the thalamocortical loop in our brain, which limits what you can pay attention to. The prefrontal cortex where we process stuff will be overwhelmed if you pay attention to everything. So right now you're hearing my voice, you're paying attention to me. You're not hearing the traffic out in the street. You're not feeling your stomach rumble. You're paying attention, you're filtering that out and just paying attention to me. And you need to do that in order to focus. There's also a default mode network, which was responsible for us feeling that we're individuals. And it sort of binds different parts of the brain together. And what we find is that in near-death experiences and in psychedelic trips, the default mode network decreases its activity, which takes away your sense of being a discrete individual. You lose your ego. You feel one with everything. Um, and you become basically part of the universe. That's the way it feels to you. So is this true? Is this what really happens? Um, I would say that this is a model for what's happening. We don't know exactly where the filters are in the brain that filter out your thoughts, uh, or even if it's really true. Um, but it seems to be uh, what's going on. It's a way of explaining things. One more implication of near-death experiences is what it tells us about possible survival of something after death. We have a lot of information from NDEs that suggests some part of us can continue to function after death. We know that the mind and the body aren't necessarily always connected, even though they do seem to be in everyday life. Under extreme circumstances, they can function separately. We also have examples, such as I mentioned of Jack before, who saw someone after she had died that he hadn't known as died. So it suggests something about her continued to exist after her death. How long? Is it like an echo that lasts for a few minutes or hours and then fades? We also have near-death experiences in which people see loved ones who have been dead for decades. So how does this happen? So we know from NDEs 
they suggest that death is not the end, is not a termination, it's just a change of state. So what's important to know about this? First is that near-death experiences are common. Most research suggests that about one out of every 20 people in the general population has had an NDE, which would be roughly 15 people in this room right now. We also know that they are normal experiences. They're not mental illness. They're normal experiences that happen to normal people under abnormal circumstances. We also know that near-death experiences have profound after effects, both positive and negative, that need to be addressed. They also suggest that the mind may be able to function independent of the brain under extreme circumstances. And if that's the case, then it may be possible to continue functioning after the brain has died. And finally, NDEs tell us that we are interconnected. NDEs come back saying that they now realize it's like fingers on a hand. They look like they're separate things, but they're really connected. And you can't hurt one without hurting them all. This is basically the golden rule. Do unto others as you have them do unto you, which was part of every religion we have. But they say that in an NDE, you learn that it's not just a guideline we're supposed to follow, but you experience it as a law of the universe. So that is all I have to say. I will say that Pat Belisle in the center of the room works at with me at the Division of Perceptual Studies, and he has some handouts, other information for you if you want to talk to him later on. Thank you. We've got two microphones. If you want to raise your hand, we'll run to break. Hi, I'm Peter Chapin, a friend of the university. Uh, great talk. I'm fascinating. Thank you. I think, I think I need a near-death experience to improve my behavior. Can you hear me now? It's a fascinating talk. Thank you. I think I need a near-death experience to improve my behavior. But I'm, <laughs> but I'm not quite ready for that. I'm curious, the people who do, don't experience a paranormal activity, what do they experience, if anything? Um, I'm not sure I caught all of that. Were you asking about experiences well, after? Well, you said you know one in 20 people roughly experience a paranormal um, activity, right? What you're talking about, the experience of the trauma yeah. and all that. The people who don't experience that, do they experience anything? Is it just nothingness, or what have we learned? Sorry. Yeah, you were saying one in 20 people have had near-death experiences, specifically not had other paranormal or parapsychological experiences. Mm. So I don't think he's saying anything about the other 19 <laughs> of the 20. Right, right. Yeah, there are various surveys have shown that the, uh, the instance of paranormal experiences, including sense of being out of the body, are very common in our population. Um, one study done here at UVA back in the 70s showed that about 20% of the population, that's one in five people, has had a sense of being out of the body. Yeah, I'm Mark McGeeving, uh, Com School in 1977, and you, I always thought of near-death experiences as a very positive event, always helped people, but you said there's been a negative event to some people. Can you tell me more about that, people that have had a negative experience? Yes, yes. There are some uh, near-death experiences that are not pleasant. We don't know how many because people are more reluctant to talk about the unpleasant ones. But most people who study this think that between 1 and 5% of near-death experiences are unpleasant. Um, I have heard a very few that have typical hellish imagery of fire and brimstone and demons. I've only heard that from people who were raised in, in religions that taught that, uh, some Roman Catholics and Southern Baptists, but they're very a very small number of those. There's a larger group that have just a sense of being in a black void for eternity with nothing, no sight, no sound, just your consciousness and nothing else for eternity, which is terrifying for most Americans. Interestingly, I've talked to some people who are raised in Hindu cultures where they experience that as nirvana. But the vast majority of unpleasant near-death experiences are just like the pleasant ones as you describe them, but they are experienced in a terrifying way. They'll feel like they're ripped out of their bodies and thrust down a tunnel at blinding speed, 
and they're desperately trying to get back in control. At some point, many of these people will give up trying to fight back for, to get into control, and they will just surrender to it. And as soon as they do that, it becomes a blissful experience. So what I think is unpleasant is not the experience itself, but the process of fighting against it. And most of these people seem to be people who are, have strong need to be in control in their lives, which is typical of most Americans. And they find that the loss of control in an NDE can be terrifying for them. Hi, my name is Cynthia. I wanted to ask if, um, I'll stand up. Hi. Hi. So other than um, non-drug-induced or a non-NDE, is there any studies um, here that you've got done that, um, did you hear the beginning? So non-drug-induced, not like flying to Peru and taking drugs or, um, or a non-NDE experience. Is there any studies for people who have had, have you studied at all, people who have had any kind of divine? Yeah. And I would like for you to just expand on that. Um, and would you find any correlation between um, an NDE and that experience? Yes, yes. Uh, coming close to death is just the most common way to have an experience like this in our culture. But there are many other ways to have them. And certainly, psychedelic drugs have been used throughout the centuries. But most religions have developed uh, techniques, technologies for inducing these, whether it's by prayer or fasting or flagellation or um, uh, you know, di different drumming and singing, ways of inducing an altered state that brings you out of your body into connection with what they call the divine. And I think near-death experiences are not, um, not so different from a lot of these other experiences. It's just that in our Western culture, they occur to us unexpected and unwanted, which makes the outcome very different from someone who's actually trying to achieve this state to some spiritual discipline. So when you um, people um, discuss like their NDE experience, do they, is there any research goes into perhaps, um, if we're all in the same universe, right? If this is what they explain, right? We're all connected. Is there any research, whether you're religious or not, um, is there any connect? or has it been like mind mapped in a sense um, of all these studies? Um, was there anything perhaps in their family, um, people that you're connected to, mm -hmm. how that's connected to you and how that experience possibly could be good or bad? I, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I'm not aware of how you could really study that. That's a challenging question. Um, a lot of people who have had an experience like this say that they've learned that's the way things are, but I don't know how to study that objectively. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist. My name is Phyllis Katsharis, and I've also been studying Tibetan Buddhism for many years. And this has helped me put some of that together, which I really appreciate. One of the things in Tibetan Buddhism, when we talk about mind, is it centered in the heart. And I wonder if you could speak to how your research might connect all of that? Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, we've just been assuming that the mind is connected to the brain because that's what we're taught in medical school. But as you said, there are other cultures, not just Buddhist, but some of the ancient cultures as well, locate the mind in the heart. Um, now, I don't know of any modern research that has been done in this culture that has tried to corroborate it. But anecdotally, there are people who have heart transplants, who are taking on the thoughts and the personality of the donor of the heart. And as far as I know, that doesn't occur with any other organs that are transplanted, just with the heart. So I don't know how to explain that. Hi. Thanks very much. It was a great talk. And I've seen you speak uh, at various times and a uh, good friend of uh, Jim Turner. So oh. thank you very much. Uh, I'm a professor emeritus at, at UVA, and I was wondering if you've done any collaborative work with the Monroe Institute. I've done their gateway experience and had some out-of-body kind of experiences there, not NDEs. Uh, but uh, I know the last time I was there, a lot of people, Bruce, who were down there were there to try to connect with uh, departed ones, and a number of them 
were successful. So I wonder if you have any collaboration with the Monroe Institute. Uh, yeah, yes, we do. Um, one of my collaborators, Marie, Marietta Pelovanova, is doing some research with me right now during there, looking at uh, people who go into various programs at that Monroe Institute, one dealing with near-death experiences and one dealing with out-of-body experiences. And we're doing before and after studies of personality changes as they go through these uh, changes. In addition, um, one of the directors of our lab, uh, Ross Dunseith, is now the director of research for the Monroe Institute. And he's doing a lot of research down there that would go back and forth with us. Uh, hello, my name is Carl. I'm wondering if you have had any experience with people who have had multiple NDEs, possibly two, maybe even cases where they string multiples of them and th for some reason they're prone toward this. Yeah. And yeah. they'd have a lot of accidents. Yeah. I do know people who have had uh, two, three, or four, and even five near-death experiences. Um, and I've been curious about this, but we have very small numbers. But it does not appear to me that each one builds on the previous one. Uh, some of them are identical, um, and some are just totally, totally different from each other. Uh, it doesn't seem to make any progression. It's like having dreams on different nights. They could be similar, or they could be totally different. Uh, more often, I've heard people who had a near-death experience and then subsequently had another cardiac arrest or some other accident and didn't have anything. And we're very disappointed that it didn't come back again. All right, two more questions. Uh, so uh, my question is, how with the numbers being so small, do you do the research? Very slowly. Uh, you know, I've been doing this for about 50 years, and I've got a collection of more than 1,000 near-death experiences who have been filling out questionnaires for me for all that time. And you gradually collaborate with other researchers in other countries who have different samples, and you put it all together, all together and you get large enough samples. Hi, I'm Amy. So um, I yeah. shared with you that I had a near-death experience in 1974. I was five years old on the operating room. Uh, surgery and my heart stopped, which I didn't know till after surgery, but, but uh, I'm Amy. And in 1974, my heart stopped on uh, while I was being operated on. I was five years old and I did float out of my body and saw them operating on me. And after surgery, I was telling the surgeons and my family and they all thought I was crazy. Um, it's it still to this, you know, I had things people telling me that. But my question is, which we kind of talked about, having experiences of being able to connect um, with people who have crossed over, who have transitioned, being able to see energy. It, has that been studied, the after effects of near-death experiences of more being open? Um, yeah. if, is that something that's been studied more? And is that something going on? Because that has definitely happened, and I've been told. Uh, that I've been th kind of you. crazy. Thank you. It, uh, it is being researched. It's a difficult area to research. Um, but anecdotally, many people who have a near-death experience or some similar experience report being opened up by that, and the doors never quite close again, and they're open to other things. And some report um, being able to be healing healers, and some report seeing auras, and some just report leaving their bodies repeatedly or hearing some dis some non-physical entity still communicating to them. It's like a, a guide. Um, okay. So I will say that I, I am a healer. I'm now a, a Reiki master and doing things like that. And people will say that I was a massage therapist for years and still am, but they're like, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? And I'm like, yeah. but yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. And then now I understand that's what's happening. Yeah. That all of this had opened me up to that. Yeah. So yeah, I would be love yeah. to be studied more. I will say that most near-death experiencers tell me that they don't see the point of doing scientific research. They know that it's real, so what do you, you don't need validation for it. But many of them who do feel sensitive now to other en energies will volunteer to work in hospice or in palliative care units, and they say they know when someone is getting ready to leave the body and when they do leave the body, and they're able to provide some comfort to them and their families. Thank you.
Thank you all for joining. And um, on behalf of the Lifetime Learning Program and the Alumni Association, we want to give you a. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grayson. And, and he, he'll be selling his um, books, the bookstores over here, if you want to grab one of his books. And we've got one for our raffle prize. If you want to draw a name out of the raffle box there, draw, that's the, let me pull <laughs> there. Thank oh. you. Who have we got? Carolyn Boone. Caroline Carolyn Boone. Boone. Okay, great. Well, everybody enjoy the game and join us uh, next time for more than the score.